Imagine. Let's say you're watching TV. The show starts off wholesome enough, but then let's say for sake of argument, a man and a woman kiss out of wedlock. Now I know that might be painful to think about, but bear with me. First, you want your wife to take the kids out of the room and remind them that God did not approve of the message they just saw. God knows that kissing out of wedlock leads to poverty and thinking the Beatles are good, and God would never curse his child with either of those. Next, if you, hypothetically speaking, happen to have a blunt object around, the moral next step would be to eliminate the liberal propaganda. Hey y'all, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about Ben Shapiro, a man famous for owning and dominating liberals with his big smart brain. With titles like these, I suspect he dominated his intellectual rivals, right? Like he absolutely owned another nationally recognized media personality. Oh wait, he's just arguing with 20 year olds with little to no debate or media training? So he's a bully. For today's video, I'm going to dissect his opinions on TV. His thoughts on the subject are voiced in the PragerU video, Hollywood Wants Your Money and Your Mind. In the video, he explores the relationship between TV and its viewers, and claims that Hollywood has crafted liberal propaganda through the medium of television for decades. As my video title implies, he misses the mark a wee little bit. Oh, that was, oh, to cut that. <laughs> to make my case, I'll discuss theories about our relationship to media, I'll dissect the hypocrisy of his claims, and then I'll wrap up by addressing how his video impacts discourse. So, without further ado, let's adieu. God, I need to stop these accents. Part 1. Communication Theory baby. My understanding of communication theory is about on par with my understanding of women, which is to say I'm in awe of the sheer power each possesses. I only took a couple of classes on communication in college, so I'm sure I'll sound rather baseline for any experts in my audience, but for my fellow novices out there, I'll be linking to the studies I discussed down below. Ben opened this video by asking people to imagine an organized group that has the ability to beam propaganda directly into your brain. He reveals said group to be Hollywood, and I think we're meant to react by clutching our pearls? Ben isn't directly naming a communication theory, but the phrase beam propaganda directly into your brain uses the language of hypodermic needle theory. Hypodermic needle theory posits that the media has the power to inject highly influential messages directly into passive and susceptible audiences. Since those audiences have no other sources of information by which to compare the media's messages, they have no choice but to act on those messages. Hypodermic needle theory was developed in response to the rise of mass media and propaganda in the 20s and 30s, with ads and propaganda becoming rapidly more common and their creators becoming more literate in ways to persuade people, theorists began to believe that media had a direct influence on its viewers. One shaky study at the time found that there were impacts on children moviegoers ranging from learning and attitude change to emotional stimulation and behavior influence, which contributed to the notion that people were helpless actors in the face of media. Desiring to limit the spread of harmful content, the FCC and Hayes Codes were created in 1934. Hayes Codes included a ban on homosexual acts under the guise of sexual perversion, a part of Hollywood history I'm sure Ben's a huge fan of. But in the 80 or so years since the hypodermic needle theory was created, it's been shown to be less than accurate. In 1940, the People's Choice Study looked into the media's impact on the upcoming presidential election and found that media was not the biggest impact on swaying voters. It was actually interpersonal communication with peers. So regardless of how airtight a media outlet or campaign's message was, it was clear that people were more capable of reasoning through media messages than scholars originally thought. The findings of the People's Choice Study started deconstructing the idea that media had supreme control over its viewers. Now let's be clear, no one communication theory is right. They're all uh, theories after all. But no matter which modern communication theory you cite, each one treats humans as reasonable actors, a result of the 80 years of research that trend toward that conclusion. Whereas the hypodermic needle theory, the one Ben is citing here, treats people as passive actors incapable of reasoning, a stance that, again, studies have heavily suggested to be inaccurate. So moving forward, I just wanted to make sure to clarify that when Ben cites an example of TV impacting culture, he's not addressing the audience as reasonable and active participants, he frames people as helpless against the media's messages, a tactic we'll get into later on. Part 2 theory in motion. 
Let me make one point clear at the start. I believe that representation is good. Bold stance, I know. I think it's important to have characters and stories from a variety of backgrounds in media. And I believe that representation's good for our society, nudging us closer to a non-discriminatory place. So in this section, I'm not arguing that representation has zero impact on culture. Rather, I'm trying to deconstruct the godlike power Ben prescribes to TV. Early in his video, he discusses the sitcom Maud. A year before the Roe v. Wade Supreme Court case, the top-rated TV sitcom Maud featured a storyline in which the title character of the show has an abortion. The LA Times described it as a watershed moment in TV history. Why? Well, because it removed the stigma of abortion. Here we see his direct language manifesting. Maud didn't just influence what its viewers thought about abortions, it removed the stigma single-handedly. Now, I think this moment in TV history is kind of neat. However, when Ben says that it removed the stigma surrounding abortion, he betrays the larger context. I don't know what America Ben lives in. The stigma of abortion is nowhere near removed. It's still a hotly contested issue, evidenced by the decades-long push from conservatives to stack the Supreme Court and eventually overturn Roe v. Wade. To say that the stigma has ever been removed, regardless of who you attribute that removal to, is asinine. Also, Ben conveniently fails to mention that the Supreme Court had already been discussing Roe v. Wade for a year prior to the episode of Maud airing. So claiming that the episode is responsible for the decision of the case is rubbish. Ben also fails to acknowledge the groundwork that advocacy groups have put in for years prior to and after Roe v. Wade that have impacted our nationwide thoughts on abortion. So right off the bat, we see that his guiding communication theory prescribes way too much power to TV and ignores other contributing factors. But don't worry, it gets worse. For another example of his flawed approach to TV, let's turn to everyone's favorite 90s sitcom that is definitely aged perfectly and isn't at all starting to feel like a relic. Friends. Ben Frame's TV is structured around creating likable characters, putting them in situations, and asking tough questions like, Isn't it really okay that Rachel from Friends decided to have a baby without first marrying Ross? After all, you like Ross and you like Rachel. How can what they do be bad? I'm not a high level enough philosopher to get into the religious fundamentalism here, so instead I'll unpack the practical reasons somebody might use to advocate against childbirth outside of wedlock. Most often being concerned for the economic stability of a child raised in two single parent households. Oh, but don't you worry, Ben. In this particular case, there is no reason to be concerned. Ross is a doctor of paleontology, and Rachel's an executive at Ralph Lauren, so money wouldn't be a worry for the kid. Since the economic concerns don't apply and the pair's cordial enough to provide a stable environment for the kid, Ben's only remaining reasons for saying that this is a problem are religious ones, which, again, haven't leveled up in philosophy enough to really address. But that's not even to begin addressing the baseless claim that this arc in Friends led to a massive increase in childbirth outside of wedlock. As Ben himself has said, sex outside of marriage has been happening forever. So to link an age-old concept to a pretty new TV show is literally baseless. Pretty cringe argument here, not very poggers of Ben. So once again, we see Ben's communication theory portraying these minor moments in TV history as supremely impactful. Lastly, we have Ben's thoughts on Will and Grace. Before the hit NBC show, the most Americans had a live and let live attitude toward private sexual behavior, few supported the idea of men marrying men or women marrying women. But seeing the charming and funny Will Truman live his life week after week, paved the way for a much wider acceptance of same-sex marriage. Before debunking his point, I want to make sure that y'all know Ben Shapiro thinks gay marriage is a horrible sin. So if you catch him in an interview saying something to the effect of, I'm okay with it, he only shifted his goalposts that much because his side lost. He was perfectly okay with the government interfering with the institution of marriage when it was a thing only heterosexual couples could partake in. Unlike Friends, I'd never seen Will and & Grace, so in researching this video to learn that it featured multiple expressly homosexual leads was awesome. A lot of sitcoms of that era, like Friends, only ever featured gay side or bit characters, and to cite Jack Saint's video on the subject, didn't always handle them well. So Will & Grace's place as a watershed moment in representation is valid. But again, Ben attributes a TV show existing to a larger cultural shift, and in doing so ignores decades of activism. What about the protests and pride parades that happened before Will & Grace, most done with hostile opposition readily nearby? If anything paved the way for wider acceptance, it wasn't a TV show, 
It was the community activism on the streets for decades. Let us take this moment to remember that Stonewall was a riot. To attribute the decades of work these communities put into ending the harassment and violence committed against them to a TV show that came out decades later is disrespectful. Not only that, for what it's worth, favorability toward gay marriage largely stagnated during Will and Grace's run, yet it jumped nearly 20 points in five years after the show ended. Is that because Will and Grace convinced suburban wine moms that gay people are all right? Or did the 20 point swing in the number of states that legalized it occur because decades of riots, protests, and pleas with politicians finally got people in power to accept their humanity and civil rights? While it's likely a bit of both, the bulk of the credit goes to the activists, not the show. Ben fails to acknowledge that Will and Grace benefited from wider acceptance established through said activism and wouldn't have had a platform to exist on without it. Therefore, it's intellectually dishonest to place all of the credit on Will and Grace. So after dissecting a few of his examples, you might have thought his argument couldn't possibly get any worse. Just wait till I point out his contradictions. Part 3. The Hypocrisy. Oh, the Hypocrisy. After looking at a number of Ben's examples, it's clear that he vastly overstates the impact of TV shows. Outside of perhaps Mauve, each example is more so a reflection of a change in culture than the aggregator of said change. But let's, for the sake of argument, assume that Ben's guiding theory is correct. The media can beam ideas into your brain directly, no questions asked. Ben frames this level of influence as frightening and worth keeping in check. But if media really does impact us that directly, what does Ben have to say about right-wing television? If the act of beaming ideas into people is so bad, I'm sure he rails against conservative TV too, right? Oh, but Ben, master debater that he is, tiptoes away from that topic by claiming that all TV is liberally biased. Hollywood has had a tremendous influence on our culture, and that influence has been all to the left side of the political spectrum. Which is... A lie. While TV history has shifted to the left, Ben ignores periods in TV history or relevant genres with a conservative ethos. Conservative stances pop up often in police serials, a popular genre since the early days of TV. And let's not let the Reagan era conservative influence on TV go unchecked, which we see pop up in sitcoms like Family Ties and Full House. Many horror movies, especially those in the 60s and 70s like The Exorcist, asserted that God and the devil are real, with many movies having a conservative Christian lens into what constitutes good and evil. Renegade Cut has a great video on the subject, linked in the blurb above if you'd like to watch. Also this last point to be fair is a single line, not a wider cultural movement, but when people complain about Hollywood being all to the left, I can't help but think of this one line from Ghostbusters. I've worked in the private sector. They expect results. That line is so quintessentially conservative, it feels like Ronnie Reagan wrote it himself. With as little time as he spent dealing with the AIDS epidemic, I'm sure he found some time to put pen to paper. Ben, in his sweeping claim, also ignores the tight, legislative grip on TV that Christian conservatives had from the 30s up until the late 60s. The Dick Van Dyke Show, which Ben for some reason praises as the paragon of Golden Age TV, is the perfect example of a show from that era pushing back against the conservative grip. As an example, got pushback on attempts to have the wife wear khakis and made the married couple sleep in separate beds. These are not liberal stances, these are extremely conservative ones. Sure, the team wanted to push some boundaries, but to act like the industry of Hollywood was wholly progressive in that era is a flat lie. Again, things like the Hayes Codes made it literally illegal for certain liberal ideas to be produced. Now you might say, that's too many years back to be relevant. TV's been liberal ever since. And to that, I would say, not entirely. ABC, the very network that canceled Last Man Standing, in the 90s placed parental advisory warnings before an episode of Ellen that had two women kissing. That warning had historically been used to warn about harsh language, violence, and nudity, which neither that episode of Ellen nor the show as a whole contained. Now maybe the takeaway you have here is that ABC is a spineless corporation, endlessly concerned with just pleasing its advertisers, and I'm glad we can agree that Disney's a sellout. But don't let that muddle the fact that this nonetheless shows that not every era of TV history, including recent eras, have been wholly liberal. 
my final and super recent example. When discussing Avatar The Legend of Korra's finale, the co-creator said, We approached the network, and while they were supportive, there was a limit to how far we could go with it. So while one might choose to focus on the word supportive here, let's not forget that putting a limitation on how explicit a lesbian relationship can be is censorship. This example reveals that even today, not all TV is allowed to be as freely progressive and propagandizing as Ben suggests. So clearly TV isn't all left-leaning. The question now becomes, how does Ben feel about these moments in TV history where conservative values were beamed directly into our brains? If Hollywood is beaming social justice propaganda into our brains right now, wouldn't conservative TV be engaging in the same influence? After all, in Ben's eyes, TV will always have this relationship with its viewers. Wouldn't it be fair then to say that Last Man Standing is looking to beam conservative values in the same way that Modern Family is looking to beam liberal values? And if so, wouldn't that be a moral problem for Ben? Seems like Ben must be overdosing on his cognitive dissonance pills because it turns out he's a big fan of conservative TV. For decades, Hollywood promoted traditional American values. That changed, as did so much else in the late 1960s and 70s, when Hollywood stopped celebrating American values and started transforming them. Notice how his wording changes here. Hollywood didn't beam conservative values into people, it merely promoted them. Which is ass backwards to hear coming out of his mouth. Considering the TV shows were forced by literal law to keep up with the Hayes Codes and their conservative values. Not all the shows were celebrating those values out of a love for them, they were restricted from artistic expression. Also, there's a weak argument from tradition here, that the act of reinforcing an old idea is somehow better than reinforcing a new idea. But that brand of traditionalism is the bedrock of Ben's conservatism, so I don't know what I really expected. Since Ben is clearly a fan of shows that feature conservative values, what we can gather is that Ben's not actually upset that Hollywood supposedly has these tools to control the mind of its viewers. If he did, he'd be railing just as much against conservative TV shows. In actuality, Ben's just upset that those tools are being supposedly used to spread liberal ideas instead of conservative ones. Which may sound like a contradiction so deep that it ruins his whole argument. Which it is, but only if we take him at his word. You see, I'm not entirely convinced that Ben really believes everything he's saying about TV here. Feels like it could be a rhetorical tactic. Let's get into it. Part 4. Conclusion So far we looked at Ben's guiding theory, we've dissected his supporting arguments, and we've discovered the hypocrisies in his stance. But one question keeps popping up in my mind that I haven't properly addressed yet. Why does Ben employ so much fearful rhetoric? Why does he at one point compare the innocuous messages of TV to literal cancerous causing carcinogens in cigarettes? What is he trying to get across? Setting aside the range of issues I disagree with Ben Shapiro on, he's always struck me as intelligent. Which is why it's surprising that so many of his arguments here come off as extremely unaware of how the world works. Like, duh, obviously media tries to persuade people. Whether that's to persuade them to buy a product, or vote for a politician, or think gay people are alright. This is like day one media literacy shit. He's clearly aware of that common goal, seeing as the very video he's making is engaging in the same attempted persuasion as any other piece of media. So I don't interpret the failures of his argument as a series of missteps. Rather, it feels like he's ignoring larger contexts and misrepresenting our relationship to media as a rhetorical approach meant to instill fear in his audience. Now obviously that's speculative, and while I'll never fully know if that's his true intent until he says it outright, we can see that his video reaches that conclusion regardless of intent. Ben encourages skepticism when consuming content, which is good. But the skepticism isn't framed as neutral or just a helpful little tidbit. It's framed as a necessary line of defense, a rebellious act even. So being skeptical here is posited as the only way to protect oneself from the left's ideas. Positioning his skepticism as such is potentially harmful for ongoing political discourse. Let's take transgender rights as an example. Shows like Transparent are doing their part to try and humanize trans people. But if that attempt at humanizing a group of American citizens is framed as a part of some nefarious plot to make you think like they think, it's not a stretch to say that Ben's proposition encourages people to shut themselves off from new ideas. How else are they supposed to keep themselves from thinking like the liberals want them to think if they don't have some intense defense mechanisms like that? And while Ben explicitly says keep watching TV at the end, the damage is already done. Judging by the comments, his video led a lot of people to either stop watching TV entirely, 
double down on their previous commitment to not watch TV or to extremely skeptically consume content for the rest of their lives. I want to reiterate that skepticism is wonderful. It's absolutely sexy and just radiates big brain energy. But Ben combines that skepticism with a fear of some impending, ominous, mind-controlling other, which channels that good energy in an unhealthy way. Because the rest of his video advocates for taking up arms in a life-or-death battle in his precious culture war. Anyway, that'll be it for this video, everyone. If you enjoyed it, be sure to toss me one of them likes and subscribe down below, making sure to ring that little bell so you can know the exact nanosecond I post a new video. Thanks much, and I'll see y'all next time.